Section 23 of From the Latch Key of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. From the Latch Key of My Book House, edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. The Interesting History of Old Mother Goose The most remarkable dame in all history who was born gray-headed and yet never grows old, who perennially keeps her charm, who is ever, forever, calling out the spirit of childhood in the human heart to go gambling with her over the green, turning somersaults, kicking up its heels, and yet learning, too, at her knee, from her quaint store of sage and precious nonsense, is that beloved old creature old mother goose who she was and how she was and why she was who knows her personality remains enshrouded in the most delightful mystery but for myself i believe she has dwelt forever in the human heart her rhymes and jingles are nothing more nor less than the spontaneous bubblings of the eternal spirit of childhood that delicious joyous nonsensical wisdom which is foolishness only to men the rhymes and jingles of old mother goose are a gradual growth like the old folk tales composed at no one time by no one individual but springing up all down through the ages who knows how naturally spontaneously joyously like the droll little jack-in-the-pulpits and dutchman's breeches of the woodland they need no other claim to a reason for being than the pure joy of expressing that bubbling spirit albeit sometimes by means of well-nigh meaningless words and the everlasting delight of man in rhyme and rhythm and musical arrangement of sounds what other excuse for existence save its beautiful arrangement of s's is needed by that immortal line sing a song of sixpence there have been many interesting theories as to the origin of the name mother goose but the one most stoutly maintained was advanced in the quaint little volume published at boston in the year eighteen thirty three by the firm of monroe and francis under the title quote, the only true mother goose without addition or abridgment embracing also a reliable life of the goose family never before published End quote. according to this story a certain thomas fleet born in england and brought up in a printing office in the city of bristol came to boston in the year seventeen twelve when that city was little more than an overgrown village with its narrow crooked streets still bespeaking the cow paths from which they sprang here thomas fleet established a printing office in that street of the delectable name pudding lane where he published small books pamphlets and such matter as came to his hands it was not long before he became acquainted with a well-to-do family of the name of goose and he grew exceedingly fond of the pretty young daughter elizabeth goose under the date june eighth seventeen fifteen there appears in the record of marriages still preserved in the historic old town hall of boston an entry recording the wedding by the famous rev cotton mather of thomas fleet quote, now residing in pudding lane of this city to elizabeth goose End quote. The happy couple took up their residence in the same quaint little house with the small paned windows where the printing office was situated in Pudding Lane, and Elizabeth's mother, old Mother Goose, went to live with them. Here various children were born to the fleets, and old Mother Goose, being a most devoted grandmother, was so overjoyed that she spent the greater part of her time in the nursery, pouring out to the little ones the songs and ditties which she had learned in her childhood. The industrious father, Fleet, having these ditties constantly dinned into his ears, shrewdly conceived the idea of turning the discomfort thus caused him to some good account by collecting the songs and publishing them. This he did under the title Songs for the Nursery, or Mother Goose's Melodies, and he sold the same from the Pudding Lane shop for the price of two coppers apiece. 
the story further goes on to relate how a goose with a very long neck and a wide open mouth flew across the title page of the book and monroe and francis solemnly announced that they had merely reprinted these wonderful original verses this interesting picturesque and delightful tale may or may not be true certainly the grave of old mother goose remains to this very day carefully marked in one of boston's old churchyards where it is visited by many devoted pilgrims each year but unfortunately no scrap of the original book has ever been found to corroborate the claim of misters monroe and francis moreover whether the tale be true or not it still in no way explains the origin of the name mother goose for in the very childhood of thomas fleet more than twenty years before his supposed publication of mother goose's melodies there appeared in france a little prose collection of the best-known fairy tales cinderella little red riding hood toads and diamonds bluebeard sleeping beauty etc these were written by a most distinguished french writer charles perrault were published in paris in the year sixteen ninety seven and were called contes de la mer l'oeil or tales of my mother the goose on the frontispiece of his book is an old woman spinning and telling tales to a man a girl a boy and a cat it is not even known whether perrault originated the name mother goose for it is said that long before his time even the goose had been given the reputation of storytelling instead of saying of stories the origin of which they did not care to disclose a little bird told me people used to say oh a goose told me and so after all perhaps even the name mother goose belongs to the people and not to any one individual the tales of Perrault's, however, were all in prose, while it is through her rhymes and jingles that Mother Goose has won her best-deserved fame. The first known collection of rhymes under her name was published in London about 1865, having been gathered together by John Newbery, the famous publisher of St. Paul's Churchyard, and the first publisher in the world to give special attention to children's books it was he who published little goody tissues the story generally attributed to the great and lovable irish author oliver smith the prime friend of children and undoubtedly it was goldsmith who edited the mother goose melodies for newbury in welsh's life of goldsmith we are told that goldsmith taught a certain little maid quote, jack and jill by two bits of paper on his fingers end quote and that after the successful production of his play the good-natured man mr goldsmith was so overjoyed that he sang lustily for his friends his favorite song quote, about an old woman tossed in a blanket seventeen times as high as the moon End quote. in seventeen eighty five newbury's edition of mother goose was reprinted in worcester massachusetts by isaiah thomas who had married one of the granddaughters of thomas fleet and a great-granddaughter of old dame goose a very beautiful copy of this book is to be found in the boston library and since the story of thomas fleet's edition cannot be proved john newbury must be accepted as the first publisher and isaiah thomas as the first american publisher of our best beloved nursery classic some twenty years after the thomas edition another collection of nursery rhymes appeared called gammer girton's garland which contained all of the mother goose melodies and a great many more besides but much of this material was taken from old jest books and was worthless and coarse and gammer girton's garland never attained the popularity of mother goose in eighteen forty two james hallowell a man of fine scholarship made a careful study of the nursery rhymes of england collected principally from oral tradition he writes that these nonsense scraps quote, have come down in england to us in such numbers that in the short space of three years the author has collected considerably more than a thousand End quote. besides hallowell many other men of the highest literary ability have edited mother goose it is intensely interesting to know how very old some of our best-known rhymes are in the preface to the newbury edition the writer 
probably oliver goldsmith says quote, the custom of singing these songs and lullabies to children is of very great antiquity it is even as old as the time of the ancient druids caractacus king of the britons was rocked in his cradle in the isle of mona now called angolicia and tuned to sleep by some of these so peripherous sonnets End quote. old king cole was certainly an ancient celtic king of about the third century a d an original briton who lived even before the angles and the saxons had come to conquer england dim and far away seem those days in the dawn of english history when the druids still held sway with the dark mysteries of their religion in the dusky oak forests of england but the whole flashes suddenly into light and life when we realize that those were the days when old king cole was a merry old soul and a merry old soul was he old king cole he sat in his hole and called for his fiddlers three and every fiddler he had a fine fiddle and a very fine fiddle had he tweedle dee tweedle dee said the fiddlers three little jack horner too is probably early celtic and was originally a long poem containing the quote, pleasant history of all jack horner's witty pranks end quote, of which the sticking of his thumb in the christmas pie formed only an insignificant part mother may i go out to swim is fourteen hundred years old and comes from a jest book of the sixth century only to think that at the same time where minstrels were singing with wondrous dignity to courtly listeners in the great halls of the castles the sonorous and heroic lines of the beowulf children in the nursery were snickering and giggling just as we do to-day over the ridiculous jingle mother may i go out to swim yes my darling daughter hang your clothes on the hickory limb but don't go near the water and for every one man of this present time who knows the classic beowulf there are at least five hundred who know the jingle i had a little husband no bigger than my thumb is probably a part of tom thumb's history and is supposed to have originated in the tenth century from a little danish work treating of quote, swain tomling a man no bigger than a thumb who would be married to a woman three l's and three quarters long End quote. Humpty Dumpty dates back to the days of King John in the thirteenth century, when that tyrannical gentleman was quarrelling with his barons and they were forcing him to grant them the great charter of England. Humpty Dumpty had already begun his immortal escapade of falling off the wall, and if one were to inquire which had won the more enduring fame by his exploits, the answer would necessarily be that granting the foundation for all the liberties of England could never place king john in the same rank with that prime entertainer of infancy who will apparently be performing his antics unto all generations the rhyme of the old woman who was tossed up in a blanket was old in the days of henry v in the early fifteenth century when that strong-handed monarch set out with a mere handful of men to conquer france the faction opposed to him in his own country used to sing the rhyme to ridicule him and show the folly and impossibility of his undertaking representing the king as an old woman engaged in a pursuit the most absurd and extravagant possible but when king henry routed the whole french army at agincourt taking their king and the flower of their nobility prisoners and made himself master of france in spite of his mere handful of men the very people who had ridiculed him began to change their minds and think no task too difficult for him they therefore cancelled the former sonnet and sang this one so vast is the prowess of harry the great he'll pluck a hair from the pale-faced moon or a lion familiarly take by the tooth and lead him about as you lead a baboon all princes and potentates under the sun through fear into corners and holes away run while no danger nor dread his swift progress retards for he deals with kingdoms as we do our cards the queen whom pussycat pussycat made the famous expedition to london to see appears to have been queen elizabeth 
though why pussycat pussycat reported nothing more interesting at court than frightening a little mouse under a chair when she might have held forth on the subject of queen elizabeth in all the glory of her satins and jewels and stomachers and puffs and ruffs and quaffs remains a secret known only to pussy simple simon comes also from a chapbook of the elizabethan era these chapbooks were small volumes carried about from place to place for sale by itinerant merchants or chapmen it was from such books that a great number of the old rhymes came sing a song of sixpence was well known in shakespeare's time the unfortunate hector protector who was dressed all in green and met with such disfavor at the hands of the king as well as the queen was that doughty old puritan oliver cromwell lord high protector of england familiarly called old knoll who ousted charles i from his throne and could scarcely be expected henceforth to be any too graciously dealt with by kings and queens from all this account which might be lengthened still further it appears that old mother goose is no mere modern upstart but belongs to the pedigreed aristocracy of literature and must be treated with becoming consideration and respect nevertheless it cannot be denied that beside all the precious pearls of pure and joyous nonsense which mother goose has given us she has perpetuated certain unworthy pranks in the form of coarse and vulgar rhymes for which she needs to be given some broth without any bread whipped very soundly and sent off to bed in other words from the very nature of the old jest books from which much of mother goose was taken too many collections contain objectionable rhymes and the need for a far more careful selection than is ordinarily made for children's reading begins with these first rhymes which are to be given to the very littlest tots and cannot for that very reason be too carefully culled the selections in my bookhouse have been chosen for their music their melody their rhythm their joyous nonsense and quaint humor their vivid flash of quick-moving pictures the vulgarities crudities and twisted ethics have all been swept uncompromisingly into a dark closet and left there so from the pages of my bookhouse behold old mother goose putting her very best foot forward inviting you all with a curtsy whatever the birth records may say about your age to get your pipes and come skipping in her train out where the meadows are always green where lambs and children are always young and the sun is ever shining end of section twenty three